Welcome back to Ray Baby's Realm. I'm Ray Sunshine. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today, we're going to be talking about Popstar Academy, the Netflix documentary about the global girl band and how they came to be. Now, I've already done a video on my initial thoughts on the series. I watched episode one and kind of dissected my immediate thoughts. So go ahead and check that out um, and then come back. So in the last episode, we left off on for Abby being kicked out of the Academy, but I was excited and hopeful to see them bring in Manon. I did express my disappointment in the lack of diversity. I pulled up in the Times Magazine that they reviewed over 120,000 applications and the lack of shade range, the lack of body diversity, it's very apparent when you see who was casted to be able to have this opportunity. One of the casting directors, her name was Michelle. I believe the responsibility lies with the casting director and the execs who are asking those casting directors to look for certain things. If there's no pushback on either side, then there will never be any true change in who gets to receive opportunities and be looked at as desirable or beautiful. With that being said though, I really enjoyed how Michelle explained her reasoning for why she chose each girl. Her reasons were always uplifting and really nice and positive. When she introduced Manon, she described her as being beautiful, angelic, and just having that it factor that made you want to watch her. And I agreed with that. For me, she was a temperature check of the situation. I liked how she wasn't too naive and she asked questions. She even had hesitations to come out versus I feel like everyone else's reaction to the opportunity was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I got this opportunity. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And she was like, should I do this? Should I leave my family? What could happen? What could be the pros and cons of the situation? And her sister was the one who was like, well, you know, if it doesn't work out, you can always come back home. And I really like that she had that support system, but she also had that hesitation to ask the right questions, no matter how exciting the opportunity may seem on its face. What also concerned me was some of the sentiments from the girls prior to. They kind of compared Manon to being the bombshell of Love Island, which means that they would consider her a threat to their ecosystem. And this is a competitive environment, so of course, but the difference is these girls already have their friendships woven together, their cliques, and Manon is gonna be coming in on her own, which is why I really enjoyed the fact that she was asking those questions to kind of investigate the environment here. Like, how often do you speak to your family? Do you guys get to do other things? Are you always required to be here? And just hearing Ilya describe how she hasn't spoken to her parents and in days or sometimes weeks because it can get that stressful it can, the workload is a lot when she comes to the scene some people are hugging her and they're very inviting and i was looking to see who would be a little more standoffish and of course we can only look at what's been recorded and edited and that does not mean that that is exactly how it happened but i did watch how naisha was not as excited as the other girls and i'm gonna blame that on the effects of tokenism and being the only black girl in the room and when there is another black girl that enters the chat you begin to wonder is there only one spot for one black girl you know and it becomes a competition a silent competition between the two and it's completely unfair another thing that i learned from episode two was more about nikki the instructor the heels instructor and how she's sisters with missy and I can tell you right now, I'm not a fan of either one of them. For one, Missy, she does a lot of crying, even though she's the one who is inflicting some of the emotional trauma on these girls by being complicit in the way that this whole show is ran. And Nikki as well. I don't like her approach to teaching. She openly admitted that she does not give positive reinforcement because she doesn't want their heads to get too big. I believe if you're an instructor and you don't know how to teach without belittling or invalidating, then you're not a good teacher. Another example of this is when she's speaking to Ilya about her progress. They put the girls in different levels, A, B, C, D, and that determines what you get to work on and if you're ready to work on certain things or not. So they're having a discussion about whether or not Ilya should move up a level or go down a level. And Ilya is like, I have been practicing. I have been doing this. And Nikki's like, no, you're not. No, you haven't. How many hours have you been doing it? And Ilya's like, I don't count them. And she's like, okay, well, let's start counting the hours. That's, that's what you should have opened with. Well, how many hours do you practice in heels? I don't know. 
well, how about we start recording how many hours and then let's bump up those hours and see if there's a significant change in the way that you dance in noodles. But to immediately invalidate someone and say, no, you haven't been practicing. No, you haven't been doing that. When you don't know, that's not constructive. It, it doesn't help. And that's just what they showed on the screen. So I can only imagine the invalidating things or belittling things she has said to them off the camera. Also, I want to go back to dragging Missy just one more time because from the beginning it was very apparent that Missy was vehemently trying to get rid of Naisha. Even in like episode one, she was advocating for Naisha to go home because Abby was a hard worker and X, Y, and Z. And Naisha isn't just, she isn't there yet. She's too aggressive. She's not gonna be able to just do a square box like we need. You got her because she was out, out of the box. You got her because she was unique and she was gonna bring that masculine, aggressive energy that you found so intriguing. And now you just wanna drag Naisha for who, who she is and how she is. And you finally got your opportunity to cut her loose. So this huge, devastating thing happened where um, the execs found out that the girls had private Instagram accounts where they only followed each other. So they kind of came up with their own digital society. And I don't know who spilled the beans, but just remember, these execs are not your friends. And if you violate something, they have to report it and they have to discipline you for it. Now, my issue is everyone was not disciplined the same. So Missy's reasoning for getting rid of Naisha was that she posted the original song and had outside people following her that were outside of the organization, which Naisha expressed that, no, I was only following the girls. No one else was a part of my follow list. You can look at it. I have screenshots. Missy was not trying to hear that. She just, she was, she was wait, waiting to cut the cord. Afterwards, everyone received media training on it and everyone just had to turn in their phones before rehearsals going forward. Naisha was the only one who was kicked out, even though everyone did the same exact thing. Maybe they didn't post the song, maybe they didn't post it yet, but they all were under the impression that it was okay because they had a secret digital community with each other. They all needed to receive that training afterwards. And I keep cutting out my sentiments about song because Every time I bring him up, I have nothing nice to say, but I just have to touch on it because of his reaction to finding out the information is so dramatic. You know, he's cold hearted, he's blunt. During evaluation, he gives it to them straight, breaks them down. But then when something happens to him, he's a total drama queen. Like for him to sit in front of those girls and for Missy to give this speech, we are incredibly disappointed in you all. We cannot believe you've done this. And Sun is just so uh, distant. He can't even look at them. And it's just like, oh my gosh. Especially when you find out some of the girls have been involved in way more problematic things. There's a lot of outside drama that they neglected to um, include in this documentary. But this really, this is the moment where we act like they're such horrible people for just being kids for just being young. And he's he's up there just, oh, I can't believe they've done this. Oh, I'm just so disappointed in you ladies. Like, stop it, stop it. Just give them the media training and go on. You're working them to the bone. They were looking for fun to be alleviated, to have their own thing away from everything that you tell them to do. So Naisha's being kicked out of the house and she gives her exit interview. She talks about how she doesn't know what she's gonna do. She's gonna have to figure it out and how she's been without money before. And I feel that because as a dancer, gig life is really hard. When you're up, you're up. And when you're down, you can be down pretty bad. So it's scary and it makes you think about the rest of the girls, like when they don't get the opportunity, what are they going back to? Like Adela, she dropped out of high school for this opportunity. She's gonna go back and, and do what? Some of these girls are going back to impoverished spaces and communities and this was their big ticket out. And it's like, what do you do being in this wormhole for uh, which some of the girls have accounted lasted two to four years for them. What do you do? You've been in this wormhole for so long and now you're back into society and with what to show for it. So yeah, that's just something to think about. So now we're back, one girl gone and now we have to fill up five more spots to meet this 20 person quota for this secret survival show that the girls have no idea they're going to be a part of. Michelle, the casting director, has to come in and do what she does best. So I'm going to introduce them one by one. First, we have Laura. Immediately, she's that girl. She's a strong vocalist. She has her own look. She's unapologetically herself. She's unique. She has her own following. She's giving 
soloist and sometimes that can be a red flag because i think their formula is to train people up to be just good enough to be in a group but not strong enough to be on their own so they don't see their value and walk away from the group down the line because this is about the money right we want them to be a group for as long as possible we don't want the contingency of somebody walking away because they're too strong of an artist right so i love laura i'm rooting for laura i did have a small worry in the back of my head, the same situation with Manon and Aisha, you know, how are her and Ezra going to get along? Is there going to be that unspoken competition because we're fighting for that one token seat? Next, we have Yunche, which I love how she stood on business about her name. She came into the house. The girls were like, why see? Why see? Like, can we call you that? And she was like, mm no it's it's yun chae which i'll give it to the girls i'm glad they gave her a space and asked her like hey do you even like that nickname and she was able to be honest and be like no i don't just call me yun chae i enjoyed that they gave her the space to vocalize whether she liked it or not and i'm glad she stayed true to herself then we were also introduced to na young she's strong vocally like she's up there with sophia and laura she's super duper pretty strong vocals and she even mentioned that she did have dreams of being a solo artist right so then we have May. she's from Japan. I found her confessional really interesting because she kind of taught me the cultural difference between Japan and US when it comes to the word cute. In the US, being called cute is actually a compliment, whereas in Japan, you do not want people calling you cute. Hirari is absolutely adorable. She's 14, she's so young, and she's doing her best to keep up with everyone around her. She's pushing herself. And lastly, we have Samara. She's from Brazil. I was super excited to see another black girl. I am disappointed in the controversy that she got wrapped up in, but I can admit at the time when I was watching her, her voice was so beautiful, angelic. She was talented. I was rooting for her hard. There was also one more new girl. Her name was Celeste. I don't remember her having a formal introduction, but I do remember her being there all of a sudden. So yeah, Celeste is also new. Now we're at the point where the girls are about to receive a makeover and we get to meet Humberto. He seemed like he was just there to dress up the girls. He was there for a good time. He wanted to make them look pretty. He wanted to help them pick out their outfits and, you know, get to know who they were. He said, let me see your baby pictures. Who were you before? And I like how he took that with him when it was time to do the makeovers. He helped Danny go back to her natural hair color and embrace some of those things by comparing her idol Shakira to look where she was when she was younger. She had her dark hair too, and you can find beauty in your own dark hair. Some of the changes I didn't necessarily agree with. I was afraid it was going to be a America's Next Top Model situation where they just do extreme things for no reason. That doesn't accentuate the model's face or features at all, or a Dallas Cowboy situation where they make a drastic change and then cut you loose. Carly going blonde? I don't understand it. I don't get it. That black hair on her really brought out her features, really accentuated her natural beauty. Celeste going pink, it was a vibe. That pink helped her stand out more. Some people need that pop of color to really bring them out, which that's why I agree with it for Marquis as well. It really helped her stand out too. But the blonde on Carly, I don't get it because naturally she was just really pretty and stood out to me with her dark hair. Okay, so this is probably the last episode I'm going to get into because I don't want this video to be too long. So we'll wrap things up after I get into episode five. In episode five, this is when the girls finally learn that they're going to be on a survival show. And it's going to be up to the public to decide who's going to finally be in Cat's Eye. And this is where there is shock, there is betrayal, and there's all these emotions. And you even hear in Ilya's confessional that she asked them in the beginning, is this a survival show kind of thing? Because I don't want to do that. And they lied to her. And they said that it wasn't going to be a survival show. And here it is where however many months, probably a year into this thing, because she said she was there for two years. Now I'm being told that I'm going to be on a survival show. So the girls have been made aware of this and they're going to be globally announced soon. The show happens live and they all stand up and they have to introduce themselves to the world. For some people it went really well, for others not so much. For Emily, they dragged her for saying hi y'all. They dragged her for being country, they, they dragged her for her accent. They said she was funny looking and her eyes were too far apart. It was brutal. Emily holds more talent in her one little pinky toe than all those people who are trying to drag her from where she comes from and how she talks. And to see them do that to her, 
was horrible. To see people deny people of their ethnicity and identity because they don't look how you think they should, they did that to Megan, they did that to Daniela. And I think that's what happens when you typecast and you don't bring that diversity. You're putting them in a position to be ridiculed or to be invalidated for the identity when you try to market them to a group of people who may not look like them. But moving on from that, we start to prepare for over the span of 12 weeks, they have to complete three missions. And at the end of the three missions, there will only be 10 finalists. The cat's eye members will be chosen live by the audience and the judges. So here we go. We're getting ready for mission one. Team A and Team B will do a dance video against each other and the other Team A and B will do um, a song, like sing a song as a group against one another. The girls are simply not ready. You got Henry, she's 14 years old and she's not necessarily keeping up with the dance, which is so interesting because Adela is teaching her how to dance more aggressive. Remember when Naisha was being ridiculed for being aggressive? And a subscriber pointed out too that Emily dances aggressive too, but they never ridiculed her for that though. You know, I found it really interesting that Adela was stepping up to be the leader in a time of crisis for Nikki and Sohn because I think Adela has forgotten that brown nosing Nikki and Sohn doesn't matter anymore because it's up to the public. You're on a survival show now and it's about outward appearance and it's not about fairness anymore. And a prime example of your merit and hard work not even mattering is the case with Adela. In the end, when it was left up to the people, she got cut. And I think being put in an unfair environment is what resulted in her resentment towards Manon and a lot of the other girls' resentment toward Manon. Another thing that was stressing everyone out was how Manon was not conforming to the guidelines like the rest of the girls were and that work hard mentality that's almost dangerous if you ask me. You got Emily who fractured a foot is coming back and ready to dance. You got Lexi who has gotten hip surgery and is ready to come back and dance. Everyone's going to look at you. Well, why can't you just push through? Why should she? It's not normal to put everything at the expense of your physical and mental well-being for at the end of the day to fill up a corporation's pockets because that's all this girl band is about to be. I mean, you got Sophia giving her dirty looks Everyone's talking about her like she doesn't deserve to be here instead of giving her the benefit of the doubt and checking on her to see maybe she moved back with her aunt because the house was overstimulating her. If you watch the documentary, it's it's chaos in there. There's stuff everywhere. There's so many different girls, so many different personalities. She could have been suffering from depression and really needed to move back in with her security blanket, which was her aunt or some sort of family. She could have been late to curfew because she just really didn't want to go back to that house and back to that chaos. At the end of the day, the public said what they said and they love Manon. And to hear Manon say that she found newfound confidence and that she was beginning to feel like she wasn't as good as she thought, that shows me she was suffering from imposter syndrome and depression. And it took the public reminding her that, yeah, you are that girl, to give her that motivation to put her all into it again. And nobody gave her that grace. Nobody gave her the benefit of the doubt that she just needed support and help and not to be demonized for benefiting from an unfair system that she never created or asked to be a part of. You need to be upset with the people who created that system and subjected you to that and brought you here on the pretense that it was gonna be about your hard work and then flipped it on you and said, actually, no, it's a survival show. Where's your anger towards them? But when you leave and thank you for this opportunity and thank you so much, you're thanking them for screwing you over. Naisha girl, you missing a couple of screws in your brain too, because I didn't heard about you and your black girl being a black girl in the middle, being black in the middle, being black in the middle, in the middle being black. <laughs> Be mad at Missy for really being your biggest op the whole time. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, let's, let's, let's go ahead and just try to wrap this up on a good note, right? I'm going to go over the mission and my thoughts. So Team B, absolutely, I think they took the cake. As well as she's super duper adorable. I would have definitely been a stan. She would definitely be one of my faves. Emily, she's such a great dancer, such a great performer. You can't help but to watch her. Team A, Megan and Daniela had really good edits really good edits. Edits are very important when it comes to public appearance. Adela's height made her stand out like a sore thumb, but not her dancing. Her dancing was really good. And Hinari, I think she just needs to fight a little bit more 
to have that energy and that aggression that was deemed so horrible on someone else's body. As far as the singing, I like Team A's outfits a lot more, that black on black, moody look, mature look, but I enjoyed the singing way more from Team B. I mean, they had Laura, Sophia, um, Nayoung, who else was on there that was really strong? Samara. The vocals were stacked on that side and they meshed very well. Whereas Team A, they sounded good individually, but they didn't sound like a group. But yeah, I, I'm enjoying, I enjoyed the performances and those are my thoughts so far on those episodes. I'll definitely be coming back to finish out the series and let you know the rest of my thoughts. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you like, subscribe, and hit that bell notification so you know when I'm posting. Did you click it? Did you click it? Thank you. Until next time, guys. Bye.